This is another episode of the Decoding Purpose podcast. My name is Rebecca Tapp, and in every episode of Decoding Purpose, we speak to humans of both influence and impact to explore how life's turning points help us to decode purpose and to ignite a more meaningful and purpose-driven life. Welcome to another episode of the Decoding Purpose podcast. As all of our regular listeners would know by now, season two of this podcast is all about decoding purpose in the turning points. Now, it's fair to say that any turning point is significant to one's life, but none is more significant than coming within minutes of losing your life altogether. And that is exactly what happened to today's guest, the one and only Greg Page, otherwise known as the original Yellow Wiggle. It was the 17th of January earlier this year when Greg almost took his final bow. He went into cardiac arrest as he left the stage at the end of an Australian bushfire relief show. Greg could have so easily died on the scene had there not been a defibrillator or a nurse who knew CPR. Instead, today, he is here to share with me this turning point, a sliding door moment in his life where the outcome for his life could have been so different had there not been the right equipment available in the room and a nurse who knew CPR. As you can imagine, in speaking to Greg, I was so curious to understand how this particular turning point deepened his connection to purpose. How did it change his perspective? And from here, how is he using this epic story to ignite social change? Now, of course, we also spoke about the Wiggles. I am guessing most of you would have heard of the Wiggles as a child, taken a nephew or a niece, or if you have kids, you probably know all of the lyrics to Hot Potato, Fruit Salad, or Rockabye Your Bear. For the 2% of you who may never have heard of the Wiggles, they are an Australian children's music group and what I would consider to be a global movement that even today continues uh, to produce television shows, release albums and to sell merchandise all over the world. So without further delay, go and grab your yellow skivvy and get ready to dance with the one and only Greg Page. Welcome to the podcast. Greg Page, welcome to the Decoding Purpose podcast. Such a pleasure to have you on the podcast with me today. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. I'm glad to be here with you and thank you for asking me to be a part of it. Oh, you're absolutely welcome. Greg, I want to start off with a question that I ask every single guest on the Decoding Purpose podcast. Over the course of your life, have you lived your purpose because you made an intentional decision to do so? Or do you think that fate or destiny played a role with regards to how you've lived your life purpose? Mm, that's a good one, isn't it? It, um, it is a big question. I, I actually think it's been something that's uh, been a subconscious calling for me, to be honest. Mm. I think it's something that as I've gotten to the age I am now, well, luckily I made it to 48 and I'm still going, um, but prior to that, it's just been this kind of intuitive pull towards various things and that landed me in various places at various times of my life. So I think on reflection, it wasn't um, it wasn't really a conscious decision as such, so much as a series of decisions that led me down a path toward where I felt I was being pulled. Mm. I, I love that you frame purpose as an intuitive pull because I personally uh, believe it's very much an energy in motion and it's something yeah. that we experience in the present moment. So this idea of tuning in to an intuitive pull is an idea that I love. So thank you for sharing that. <laughs> Good. I'm glad it resonated. Uh -huh. It did certainly resonate. Now, <laughs> A few months ago, uh, Greg, I actually took my little girl along to the Powerhouse Museum where they had a Wiggles exhibition, and I was surprised to learn that 
a band by the name of the Cockroaches was actually responsible for the creation of the Wiggles. So I was wondering if today you could share with me a little bit about your early days as a musician and how joining a rock band eventually led you to study in early childhood education before going on to create the Wiggles. Well, this is an interesting story, mm. this one, it's, and this is part of that thing of being pulled towards certain things in life. And so my connection to the cockroaches was actually as a roadie. That's how I started with the, with, well, started with the Wiggles, I guess. When I was in high school, the cockroaches had a couple of top 40 hits. So I wasn't actually a member of the cockroaches, but they were a group that I loved the music of. And so in high school, when we had the chance to do work experience, I wanted to be a sound engineer and I wanted to do work experience as a live sound engineer with the cockroaches. So I made the call to their management, asked if I could do that and they agreed. And that was really one key turning point in my life where that feeling or that pull towards my life path, for want of another word, which at the time I had no idea about really, but it was that decision to want to do work experience that probably turned my life on its head. Um, and meeting the guys in the band for the first time and resonating with their energy and keeping in touch with them over the coming years where I would go along, you know, for free and work as a roadie, lugging in gear, um, you know, on weekends when I was not at school and staying up late at night, going to venues, coming home under the age of 18, by the way, too, which probably <laughs> made my parents a little bit upset that I was doing all this stuff when I was 17. But it was something that they didn't stand in the way of, and I guess that's where I have to celebrate the role that my parents played in my journey in life in terms of where I ended up because, it, as I said, it was that relationship with some of the members of the group that really spawned the next steps in creating the Wiggles, which... Mm. Really, I guess it was Anthony Field, who was a member of the Cockroaches at the time, he asked me as a 17-year-old, he said, well, what are you going to do when you leave school? I said, well, I want to be a roadie. He said, you can't be a roadie when you're 50, so you've got to have something else that you want to do. What else do you want to do? And I said, well, I've been thinking about doing teaching. He said, well, teaching is what I'm doing at the moment. He said, I'm studying early childhood teaching mm -hmm. at Macquarie University. He said, you should come and check it out sometime. And so it was really that conversation then that led to the next phase of my life, which was creating the Wiggles with Anthony and Murray and another fellow who was at, he worked at the university, Philip Wiltshire. He worked there in the music department. And it was the, the four of us that really created the Wiggles back then. Uh, and then we invited Jeff to be a part of it as well. And it's, it's, it's really a long story. I know we only have an hour today, but um, <laughs> That's I can okay. talk for hours we about this. We can dive it's, in. <laughs> it's, it's, it's very detailed and in-depth. But, yeah, look, essentially it was that connection for me with the cockroaches' music as a teenager growing up hearing it on the radio that drew me down that path and ended up with me being a, a member of the Wiggles and doing that for 16 or 17 years of my life. Mm. And and in doing some of my research, um, am I correct in saying that some of the inspiration for the Wiggles was the fact that Anthony had lost a child to SIDS? Anthony's brother Paul lost a child to right. SIDS, um, and that was obviously a very very tough time. They, they were actually the cockroaches were actually on the road, I believe, at the time that that happened, mm. and um, it hit them all very hard, of course. Um, and I think, look. What Anthony's motivations were for wanting to start the Wiggles, I think there were numerous motivations. That that was no doubt one of them, you know, the yeah. fact that, you know, Paul had lost a, a child, the fact that Anthony was, you know, passionate about educating children and passionate about creating music for children was also obviously a, a massive factor in it as well. And so when when we created the Wiggles, that was really our determining purpose. Mm. But as I said, I think there's obviously, you know, personal reasons for everybody behind their own individual motivation for wanting to, to create it. Definitely. And, and I think purpose in general is such a, a deeply personal process. So 
Greg, to give you context on my next question, while we're having a chat about all things purpose, I believe that purpose is something that really does ask us to accept all of who we are, even, you know, even the weird and, and stranger bits of who we are. And, and it's something that asks us to ce- celebrate really what is unique about the gifts we have uh, to offer the world, rather than trying to fit into a mould of what we might traditionally think that success should look like. Now, when you started out in music, I'm guessing the goal was not necessarily to become the star of a, a children's entertainment group. So, in, if you think back to that time, in your opinion, what do you think you needed to let go of with regards to your expectations around your career to go on and invite in the success of something like the Wiggles into your life? Yeah, that's a really interesting question um, because, again, it, it wasn't something that I was really conscious of. Mm. I was so young when I started in the Wiggles. I was 19. Um, so there was a lot of a lot of growing up that I was still kind of doing at that point in time and a lot of self-discovery that kind of, look, on reflection, probably got put on hold to a certain extent. I kind of got swept up in what the Wiggles was um, without really finding myself at Mm. that point in time, if that makes any sense. Yeah. And it's something that because being the Wiggles, at the time I left the Wiggles, I was, I think, 34 years old. So I'd been part of the Wiggles for nearly as long as I'd, sorry, for nearly half the time that I'd been alive. Mm. So, and, and at a time when you really do step into self-discovery in, in your 20s where it sounds like you would have been so busy. Yeah, and, yeah. and kind of living this dual life too of Greg Wiggle versus Greg Page. And it, it's no excuse for anything because everybody has this in some way, shape or form. But I think, as I said, it kind of got put on hold for a long time. It was just like, okay, well, I'm Greg Wiggle and there's, I guess, a lot of perhaps I felt a bit of expectation about who I should be Mm. as Greg Wiggle. Mm. And, look, it's it's been an interesting journey and it's one I'm still on (laughs) trying to work out some of the answers. But, uh, you know, again, I still feel this pull towards living my purpose and it's funny how life turns on a dime sometimes and that purpose can sometimes change or pull you slightly in a different direction. I I mean, looking back, I still feel that part of my life purpose is to educate Mm. and to educate children through music and entertainment because I believe that's something I'm strongly connected to and I enjoy doing it. So I think with any... Any purpose, it's got to come from within and it's not the external rewards that you look for because that's when you can go wrong because you you place your faith in, if I want to talk in, let's say, Christian terms, false gods or false idols. Mm. Whereas if you look from any any point of, I mean, and this is what I love about spirituality and religion, it's all intertwined. They have different terms that they use to phrase things, Mm. but if you look at anything, it, it's got to come from within. It's got to come from this intrinsic motivation. And it's that intuitive, you know, if we use that word, intuitive, instead of looking within, if you just feel that intuitive pull, you'll know where you're being pulled toward. And I think when you try to align that with external success, such as money or fame or those kinds of things, that's when you can go wrong because that's the ego kind of talking and I think it's when you do things from the intrinsic point of view of wanting to to do good for the world or do do good to spread good and that's when you will find success because the success comes from within not from without. Mm. Yeah, Greg, you've actually, you've touched on there one of the reasons why I themed season two of this podcast around turning points. And and it's because I believe these turning points, whether it's by choice, and, and in some cases it is, but so often it's through a crisis. It's during those times we're really asked to let go of ego and let go of all those external things that we think identify us in order to really go within and start to tune in to what you were calling that intuitive pull, that part of us that kind of beckons us to step into something more or step into a higher potential that 
enables us to go on and offer our gifts in the world and and help other people. So, um, you know, I'm a big advocate for that part of what I call the purpose process, which is really about letting go of those external things to really begin to understand who we are from the from the inside out. So thank you for sharing that. No, that's all right. Yeah, look, that's a really interesting point, isn't it? You mm. know, talking about ego and how hard it is because, you know, in this – earthly form we are so attached to ego we are so attached to who we are when really when you look at things on a bigger scale or without the sort of earthly attachments the body we we are not who we are (laughs) it's kind of a weird concept isn't it but we are we are really the pilots of this body in this experience and we we have the power to control so much but we don't realize it and when we, when we can accept that and when we can let go of the, the need to be seen, I think that's where you find the greatest comfort in life. When you said earlier, you said that, you know, to, to just be comfortable with who you are and let go of those things that we think determine who we are, mm. that's, that's when we truly find who we are because we're free of any judgment of, from self and from others. Totally. And, you know, it's a great segue to my next um, my next question because I think as kids we are so much more connected to this kind of infinite energy. Um, you know, we spend a lot less time looking in the mirror and a lot more time out in the world and connecting with that open sense of joy and that sense of magic. And, and it's these things that really I think you have spent a career mastering. I mean, you, you obviously have an innate connection to children, hence your success in, in being a yellow wiggle for so many years. <laughs> now, I think as adults, we do seem to disconnect with this childlike sense of fun and sense of joy and expansiveness that that I was just uh, having a chat about. So with that in mind, I mean, what tools and insights or wisdom did you personally gain as a wiggle that enriched, enriched your adult life through, in some ways, directly experiencing the world through the eyes of a child? Yeah, that's an interesting one. Um, look, it's it's it opened my eyes to a lot of things and just the the pure innocence and as you said that children see the world in a different way they mm. see it without the baggage that adults see it they do see it um, with a lot more freedom than what we see it with as adults because we've lived we've experienced and we've had to try to deal with some of these challenges that we face in life and everybody faces challenges. A lot of people face some horrendous challenges, but everybody has challenges. It's just the the scale, the quantity, the the that that's what the variety is that's provided to us in life for every single person. It varies, but for children, they don't see challenges. Children are born into the world pretty much as a clean slate, I believe. There might be some baggage that they bring in as a soul from previous lives if we believe in reincarnation, mm. but they're unaware of that. And that, um, that they're not, I was going to say they're blind to it. I mean, they, they kind of are blind to it. That blindfulness um, knows no limits. So mm. a child doesn't see limits on things. And that's part of the beauty of working with children, that they're open to learning things. And they're open to experiencing the energy in the world. And it's as we get older as humans, we kind of get told not to believe in that stuff. So it's it's kind of frustrating because as an adult looking back, you can sort of see the potential that can be unlocked in children. But there's kind of this societal expectation that we have to teach them that the world is a certain way when I think that the world has a lot more potential than we give it credit for and we tend to limit limit that potential as humans. Mm. So it's a very, very roundabout way of saying that I think teaching children is about unlocking potential and helping them recognise the beauty in the world around them. 
And I think they, the the two things you've just said there with regards to potential and, and seeing the beauty of the world, um, that's such a good reminder for us in our adult lives to to still continue to see the world with a, a sense of limitless imagination about what's possible. That's right. That's mm. really the lesson, isn't it, that we as adults have to try and maintain that um, that childlike view of the world and the, the potential and the the fact that we are the creators of our own experience, we we have this incredible capability as as humans to create. And you know, I'm not talking about people who are deemed to be creative people, because everyone has this ability to use their mind to create the perfect world for them. And that's one of the things that I love learning about at this point in my life, um, because it's kind of like. You know, I look back on how I got to where I'm at and I think that part of that was that I created things. I mean, I created that opportunity to work for the cockroaches because I rang their management up to see if I could do work experience for them. So I created that mm. um, and I, I didn't put limits on it and say, no, they're never going to want to have me on board as a work experience student. They're not going to do that. I didn't put the, the barriers in place that prevented me from proceeding down that path. And I think sometimes humans do that because they're afraid. They're afraid of being told no or they're afraid of being told they're not good enough. And and that fear is what limits people in terms of wanting to be creative. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I think courage and purpose go hand in hand because you've got to show up for your purpose, for your purpose to show up for you. That, that's true. You do. And you've got to, you've got to ta- step out on a limb. I guess take take a leap of faith sometimes in order to understand that you know sometimes you can step out and there will be a safety net there to catch you uh, and that's how you find your purpose sometimes. So let's have a big a bit of a chat about one of those big creative moments uh, in the life in your life and also the life of the Wiggles. Uh, I know it was in the year 2000 when the Wiggles partnered with Lyric Studios for American Distribution. Uh, do you, you know, do you remember when that happened and how did you feel in some ways to be kind of standing in what I imagine would have been a dream come true at that point in time? Yeah, look, we had so many of those kinds of moments along the way where we just looked at ourselves and thought, my gosh, this is you know, we, we had no idea what was going to happen for us in the Wiggles when we started it. And to have moments like that where you sign up with a, an American distributor for your video content who's going to put you out to all these homes throughout the US, it's pretty amazing. And then, you know, years down the track after that, you're then playing in front of tens of thousands of people every day, um, doing three shows a day in sold out arenas throughout the US. These kinds of moments are ones that you don't take for granted and you have to appreciate, you know, what's being offered to you and what's being given to you. And I think more than that though, what I really appreciated along the way was the impact on how many lives you could actually influence in a positive way through what you were doing. And, and it's that opportunity that's being given to you to get your music out, to get your message out, to get your purpose out to so many people. And that deal with Lyric was really one of the big deals that we did in the US that enabled us to do that. Yeah, such an incredible moment. So, Greg, I know that you are also a massive fan of the great Elvis Presley. And as a salute to your admiration for Elvis, in 2005, you recorded a solo album with Elvis's backup band, the TBC band, titled Taking Care of Country. And you also had a second album with the TCB band called Let It Be Me, which was released in 2012. Um, Both you know, both of those projects and albums are super cool, but here's the really cool part. I know you also owned the fourth largest collection of Elvis Presley memorabilia in the world. And in 2008, you donated the collection to a new Elvis museum in Parks in New South Wales. Now, I personally believe that for anyone who wants to lead a purposeful life and anyone who has big dreams, having a role model or an idol to look up to is something that can really drive that forward. So my question for you is, what was it about Elvis that created that level of inspiration in your life? 
Yeah, that's a really good question. And again, it's one of those things where I just felt a pull towards his personal story. Mm. I think I felt some kind of, um, uh, what, what would be the word? I can't, um, geez. Like um, a soul connection. I, I, <laughs> yeah, look, that sounds really tacky, but <laughs> it's kind of right. Uh, look, Elvis is a Capricorn like I am, and not that the, none of this happened on a, on a conscious level. Yeah, I love what, that because I'm a Capricorn as well. Ah, right. And you'll also love, I'm sat in the studio here with a big Elvis poster behind me. (laughs) (laughs) Very cool. Um, Well, look, the the connection became, didn't become clear, but I felt the connection when I walked through Graceland for the first time and I found out more about Elvis's life off stage. Mm. I wasn't a fan of Elvis per se, had never watched any of his movies, didn't really own any of his records, but I'd listened to a lot of his music in the car with the Wiggles on tour driving around Australia because Anthony was a big Elvis fan. Walking through Graceland, there was just something about his story that resonated with me. And again, it wasn't a conscious thing. It wasn't me thinking, oh my gosh, I'm so much like this guy, you know, this has happened to me and this has happened. It was nothing like that at Mm -hmm. all. And that's why... You know, I will say it was a, a pull toward his story that I had. Then after that connection, I don't know how it happened. I was walking through a, a shopping centre in the Gold Coast one day and for some reason I just walked into this celebrity memorabilia store and right up the back behind the counter was a framed piece and it was a an Elvis Presley signed cheque. It was a cheque that he'd made out to one of his bodyguards for, you know, his weekly pay. And I, I ended up purchasing that check. That was the first thing that I ever bought that was owned by Elvis. And it was really from that then I happened to be on, I think I was on eBay one day, just browsing, and up came a pair of Elvis boots that were owned by Elvis. And I was surprised that on eBay you could buy these things that were owned by Elvis. So I bought those boots. And from there I just felt this pull towards collecting more and more items with the purpose of setting up a museum here in Australia where people could go and experience what I experienced when I was walking through Graceland, and that is to understand more about the life of Elvis and some of the struggles that he had off stage. Mm. because I don't know that a lot of people understand that, you know, I think, yeah, there was a level of happiness for Elvis, certainly, off stage, but I, I think there was also a level of you know, confusion for him about purpose, about why it was him that was chosen to be this megastar. Mm. Why was it that women were throwing themselves at him? I think he had a lot of questions. And that story to me resonated because for me at the time I was going through, you know, my first marriage I was going through some issues and I think Elvis had that same thing. He was incredibly happy on stage where he was performing, feeling that he was living his purpose, yet when he stepped off stage he was not so happy. You know, he wasn't in a happy place in that marriage with Priscilla for a number of reasons, um, but that part spoke to me. And the, this love story of Priscilla and Elvis, which was kind of heralded or touted in my mind as being sort of the greatest love story of all time, you know, this iconic singer and celebrity who fell in love with this younger woman and they were married but then they broke up they couldn't be together and I think there's a lot of evidence to say that even after they divorced they still had a strong relationship and there was a connection there for them after that point in time and it's these stories that I think other fans of Elvis who know him as just a picture on an album cover or somebody in a movie I think these are stories that can be shared with people to help them understand that, you know, despite the fame, the fortune, the legacy that somebody might have, at the end of the day, we're all humans. We're all, it's a level playing field. We all have Mm. struggles. And that, for me, I think was what summed it up. Yeah, look, that's beautiful. And I've got quite a few things I want to say to that point. Um, But the first thing that comes to mind is, and I think this might actually be true, that Elvis was a twin, right? Am I correct in yes. saying that? My dad's a That's big right. Elvis fan and I think he shared that with uh, me after visiting Graceland. Um, yeah. But what you were just talking about 
kind of reminds me of that idea that internally we kind of have a twin. And I think when you're a performer, this is probably amplified whereby, as you were just saying, there was Elvis that the world saw, Elvis who showed up on stage, Elvis who was the star, Elvis who was being what a rock star should be or, you know, being in the perfect relationship with Priscilla. But then there's the real human being underneath that and and having to accept and love the real human being is a part of stepping in to our, I guess, our true empowerment as a human being and, and our true purpose. Um, you know, and I think in the case of Elvis or even in your life, that's amplified because you're a performer. You literally do have to get on stage and be someone, which is quite different to who you are in your personal space. But I think we all experience that in different aspects of our lives where we're trying to show up to be something or be successful or sit within a certain paradigm of how we should behave. And it makes it it makes it difficult to really sit in who we are and to give that space. And um, it's also why I think the the what we're all going through at the moment with COVID-19 is interesting because it's kind of the first time we've been taken off, literally off that stage of, of life of just doing, of being busy, of showing up. And we're kind of being asked to really go within and and literally stay in lockdown and stay in our houses and and be with that that part of ourselves that we might not always show to the world. That's right. And I think there's a couple of really interesting things you've brought up there. The first Mm. thing is that thing about um, just being comfortable with yourself. And I think that is our first life purpose. And that's the struggle that, you know, I've had in the past. And I think to a certain extent, I don't know that I've got there yet. I'm still trying to be comfortable in my own skin in a number of ways, but that's the first life purpose. Once you attain that, you then go on to achieve your real purpose. I love um, that, Greg. You're so It's so true. Well, I, I think it is. I, I've doing a lot of research. There's a lot of stuff I'm looking into at the moment that's really fascinating. It's mostly around um, quantum physics and quantum mechanics. And it's something I never knew about before, but everything in my life so far has sort of brought me to this point. I've investigated spirituality, psychics, Mm. tarot, a whole lot of energetic type of fields. I've never investigated them very deeply, but I've always been fascinated by them. And as I was saying earlier, there's so many things that all tie in together. And when you investigate where they come from, it seems that they come from quantum physics. So that's my next thing that I'm going to investigate is quantum physics because I find it so fascinating. But it's that unlocking of potential that comes from acceptance of who we are. Mm. Just to go back to one of the points I made earlier about, you know, educating children, part of the conflict that we have is that there are so many expectations put on people From a young age. So, yes, expectations put on children in terms of societal behaviour and what's socially acceptable. Mm. Some of those boundaries, you know, I accept we need to have those. But I think some of those boundaries and expectations we, well, certainly when I was growing up, up until fairly recently, that these kinds of expectations and norms have now sort of been lapsed or or laxed a, a little bit to let people be more of who they are. But when you have those boundaries, that's when, like I said before, we limit people. So it's when we remove the boundaries, people can be a lot more comfortable with who they feel they are inside and that then enables them to live out their life purpose because once we get everybody um, resonating on that higher energetic frequency because Mm. they feel that sort of freedom, that's when the world will be able to resonate in one energy and attain such a greater feeling of happiness and joy and bliss throughout the world. Everyone will experience it. And the second thing you mentioned there was this time of COVID-19. Now, this has been unprecedented in my time, 48 years of life. Nothing like this has happened. Um, There's been a lot of death, a lot of devastation, a lot of grief for those people. For everybody else in the world, this is a time of rebooting, of resetting, of reevaluating life and purpose. So this very podcast that we're doing now, and I mean, I know you've been doing it for a long time, but the timing of our connection is quite purposeful mm. in that 
this time is really for the world to reflect on where we're at, how we've been living up until now, and looking at how we can live moving forward in a way where we feel more connected. Because even though we're socially isolated, one observation I've made, we're very fortunate here where we live in Sydney, we have a beautiful bike track across the road from us. So we don't have houses across the road. We've got a bush nature reserve there with a wonderful bike track that goes for about 10 Ks. I can do a 10 K walk every day if I want, but, and I usually do that. And I would even do it before COVID-19 came up. But now that COVID-19 is here and people are feeling trapped inside, what we're seeing on that bike track is so many more people getting out and exercising, which is a great thing. Mm. We're seeing more families walking together, talking together along that bike track. So it's now a time for families to actually be connected and people are finding ways to connect, not socially, but through technology. And the connection is still there with other people. But the primary connection with family and loved ones, I think, is actually going to be stronger coming out of this period and we're learning a lot from that. We're learning how, how we can actually live a life that is purposeful, that is driven, motivated, and where it's productive and we achieve things, but we actually use our time better. I think that's going to be something that comes out of this. Definitely. And, and again, it comes down to what I was talking about before with regards to turning points, acting as as these catalysts for us to kind of dissolve what's maybe not serving us so that we can amplify what will serve us. And I think that's exactly what you're talking about there. You're talking about the crystallisation of our values, of, um, you know, the positive uh, positive influences in life, like community, like exercise, like just making the space to connect with, um, with our spirituality and, and those types yes. of things. So it's, you know, it's it's been beautiful to see whilst the situation is horrible to see the silver lining of of the of the crisis that we're all dealing with at this point in time. Yeah, that's right. I think there there has to be a silver lining to it. It's not something that's come along to cause devastation. I mean, it has caused devastation, but there has to be something positive that comes out of this. And I think, yeah, you know, I think that is going to be one of the things that comes out of it, a stronger connection to self. For people, you know, to look within and find ways of being connected to who you are without being so much connected to other people and and the things that we thought defined us. Mm. So, Greg, I know over the course of your lifetime, you have certainly had a lot of high points, but the road, you know, it's, it's not always been unicorns and rainbows uh, in your world. <laughs> and we're going to talk about a few of those turning points, but I know one of them was in November 2006 when you had to leave the Wiggles due to poor health as a result of a a double hernia operation where you suffered repeated fainting spells, slurred speech fatigue and a trembling as a result of a condition, and I I hope I pronounced this correctly, but a condition called Auschwitz. No, I don't know if I can even get it out. Orthostatic (laughs) intolerance. You might want to correct me on that. (laughs) Well done. So, I mean, look, this, I, I know at this particular point in time, you were told that you might only have seven years to live. I can't even imagine what that would feel like. So how did that change your world at that particular point in time? Uh, look, that, that period of time was very, very tough because, um, you know, I was unwell and I didn't have a diagnosis for, for much of that time. And I wasn't able to do what I loved doing and I didn't know whether I'd be able to continue to do that or not. Um, so that was very, very tough then to be told, you know, in so many words that, you know, this is either going to be orthostatic intolerance or it's going to be this other very nasty thing. It was like, okay, well, that's pretty hard hitting as a 34-year-old. Yeah. Um, but, look, it's, yeah, like I said earlier, everybody goes through challenges and everybody goes through things that, you know, makes their life turn or makes them look at their life in a different way. And I guess now 14 years later, I can look back on that and be grateful for the fact that that happened. Um, I loved doing what I was doing with the Wiggles and I still love the fact that I was a part of that and I love being asked to go back and do original Wiggles concerts for the kids that grew up with the Wiggles because I'm incredibly proud of it. But that was my journey. That had to happen. Um, 
you know, as hard as it was at the time, dealing with the symptoms, dealing with the decision that I had to make mm. and dealing with the uncertainty of the future, I look back now and I'm very grateful that it happened because it's led me on a different path, a path that has, um, you know, pulled me in a different direction intuitively but still staying in that vein of um, being an early childhood educator through entertainment. So, yeah, look, I think... Yeah, it's like anything. You can look back on on things and be negative about it or you can be positive about it. And I think I look back and, and be positive and say, look, I'm glad that happened because without that turning point, without that sliding door moment, without that butterfly effect moment, then my life now wouldn't be what it is. Mm. And I know in, in January 2012, in some ways you got a nice moment in time to say goodbye uh, with the crew because it was announced that you'd be rejoining the Wiggles. However, as it turned out, it would only be for the remainder of of that particular year as it was announced that you, along with Murray Cook and Jeff Fat, would all be retiring together. Now, I'm a, a big believer that purpose is the creation of, I guess, a legacy in motion and the Wiggles were a huge part of your personal legacy. So can you tell me in your opinion, what was the magic? behind the Wiggles? Like literally, how did you guys take such a simple formula and turn it into what I would call a movement? Yeah, well, that's an interesting question. It's a, Look, I, I think the real key was the fact that everything we did, we based on early childhood development. So everything we created with the Wiggles was developmentally appropriate for the age group that we were targeting. Mm. Um, we were looking at things through a child's eyes of how they would see it, um, not from an adult's perspective of being creative, let's say. Um, and so that's, again, where I guess that's stepping outside of the self or stepping outside of the ego point of view of something and saying, well, look, we have this chance to be creative, so let's do X, Y, and Z when that's not going to hit the the mark, we were very much focused on what was going to hit the mark with a three or four year old child and making sure that whatever we produced and created was purpose driven mm. in that sense. Mm. I think I think too, we were lucky that you know the wiggles happened at a time when there was nobody else really doing what we were doing. And the fact that we were friends, we had a chemistry. We weren't a, a thrown together group made up for commercial purposes. We were you're a community. A, a group that, yeah. Well, yeah, we, and we, we happened organically and that was one of the criticisms that we had later on in, in time with the Wiggles was why are there no girls in the Wiggles? Well, the reason was just because we were four friends who created the Wiggles just because that's what it was. It wasn't set out to be a politically correct um, manufactured thing taking into account everything that could be perceived to be the best thing for children. It, we did the best we could given what With what we you were. had, yeah. That's right. And so we, we loved that. We embraced that. And we, you know, we tried to reflect female role models in numerous ways through what we produced over the years. We had a lot of female dancers. We had male dancers. We, did, you know, we, we didn't just say, oh, you know, girls are only dancers. We had male dancers as well. We had girls playing the role of doctors and all sorts of police officers, all sorts of characters throughout the Wiggles. So we did address that in those ways, but we weren't about to kind of change the essence of the Wiggles just for the sake of bringing in a, a woman um, to reflect the gender equality kind of situation. And I think that, as you said earlier, in 2012, the Wiggles did ask me to go back. Um, it, and it was actually only to, supposed to be for eight months whilst they changed over from Sam, who was the yellow Wiggle after I left, um, they were going to change from me, sorry, from Sam to Simon. Simon, who's now the red wiggle, was yep. going to be the, the yellow wiggle. Um, but then they came up with the idea of asking me to come back to transition between Sam and then so in, in essence it would be me handing the yellow skivvy to Sam in 2006, then Sam handing me the yellow skivvy in 2012, then me handing the yellow skivvy on to Simon in August of 2012. The whole changeover thing between Sam and me went wrong and there was that, that was a big mess, which I think caused Murray and Jeff to sort of look at their future with the group as well and they decided to retire at the end of 2012. Mm. So I had to actually stay on for a few more months to retire at the same time as In them. In some ways I like the fact you guys got to do that together though. There's something nice about that part. 
Yes, that, that's mm. right. That was good um, to be on that stage at the um, was at, uh, Sydney, what's that big arena there? I think it's called Kudos Arena now yeah. or something like that. Um, that one there at Homebush to be on the stage together there in the final performance of the Wiggles. Yeah, that was great because my the, the last final performance I had prior to that I didn't know was going to be my final performance. So, yeah, that, that was a good moment. And, you know, as I said, everything happens for a reason, whether you see it at the time or not. Um, things happen for a reason and our path is kind of laid out for us there to embrace or to fight against and it's the path of least resistance that is the most enjoyable one. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a, a great Steve Jobs quote that I refer to quite a lot and it's basically along the lines of the fact that you, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking back and, and that's exactly yes. what you're talking about right now. Correct. I, I also want to highlight something else you mentioned there that I think is interesting for those of you who are out there listening to this podcast day because you're wanting to get clear on your purpose, but some of you may be entrepreneurs or, you know, people out there who want to take that purpose and really turn it into a movement, which is taking it out of the me and really taking it into a space where it is something that can belong to other people. And what I found interesting about what you mentioned there was that what actually made the Wiggles such a successful formula was your ability to take the language of the of the people that you wanted to influence and work with that. So looking at what you knew would be effective for children. So rather than, you know, creating your own language and hoping it worked, actually really doing the work to understand what made children tick and what they would be able to um, connect with and relate to and that that was really what uh, enabled you to take the purpose from just being a purpose that was about you guys into a purpose that the kids themselves could own and and grow with. So I think that's an interesting lesson there. Yeah, definitely. And that that's a good point you just said there, something along the lines of the fact that it wasn't actually about us. It wasn't our journey. It was mm. the children's journey and mm. we were just – like a teacher, we were facilitating their journey and helping them connect the dots, as Steve Jobs might say. So, Greg, I know over the, the following years uh, after you retired from the Wiggles in 2012, you made a few guest appearances on the Wiggles and you also joined the cast of, of a children's educational television program called Butterscotch's Playground, which is fantastic. When you think back to sort of, you know, over the last eight or nine years, and you might have touched on this earlier, uh, did you feel like you'd kind of lost your sense of purpose post-Wiggles? I imagine a lot of your identi identity had been tied up in, in being a yellow wiggle. So how did you, you know, from, from that point forward, how did you begin to rewire your identity and your sense of self? Look, yeah, look, a little bit, I think, Um I think, though, that I always knew that early childhood entertainment was something that I wanted to do because I felt so strongly connected to it, mm. even before the Wiggles. Like I said, you know, when Anthony asked me what I wanted to be, uh, other than a roadie, I wanted to be a teacher. So that calling towards education and, and helping children, and because of my background as a musician, I think for me, that combination of the two, entertainment and education, has always been a part of me, regardless of the Wiggles. So coming out of that time with the Wiggles, I just felt that that's what I really wanted to do. And so I kind of stayed on that path. And even beyond that, you know, I'm still working in that space now, creating, doing projects that involve helping children. There's one that I'm working on called Team Rescue, and that's about helping children understand safety messages, helping them stay safe so that we don't have accidents where children, you know, get injured or potentially lose their life, um, you know, in situations where they can actually just stop and think about how they can put themselves in a safer place. So Team Rescue is very much about that as well. So I love working on that project. So that aspect is, I think, has always been a part of me. And I think that's just part of that sort of subconscious mm. or intuitive knowing of who I am and what my purpose is, uh, you know, Quite possibly nothing I ever do again will be as successful as the Wiggles, but that's yet to be seen. It is yet to be seen. <laughs> and um, and look, 
when it comes to turning points, you certainly do have a second chance here because I know on the, the 17th of January this year, everything changed when you suffered a cardiac arrest at the original Wiggles reunion show for bushfire relief at the Castle Hill RSL. Greg, can you take me back to that morning? Did you, did you feel unwell or did you have any sense that things weren't okay? No, no, I had no mm. warning signs whatsoever, no pre-existing symptoms or anything like that. So, no, look, I, I actually don't remember a lot about the day itself. I think, I, I no, I did go to the gym that morning. I was working out at the gym, um, came home, I had to fix a leaking toilet. I can remember that. And then I went to the show, went to the venue. But after that, I don't remember. I think they call it trauma amnesia. So I, I've kind of blocked out a lot of the day. Yeah. There's one part of the experience of collapsing and sort of getting into that state of almost not being here there's one part of that that I remember and that's lying on the floor struggling to breathe um but that's that's about all I can remember from that night and I woke up in hospital and my wife was standing there she happens to be a cardiac nurse and she um had come into the hospital with the kids and she was standing there and said look yeah I said to her, look, do you know what's going on? Do you know what's happened? She said, you're having a massive heart attack because at that point my heart was still blocked. I still had 100% blockage in one of my main arteries. I was waiting to go into theatre to, to get operated on. Um, but, yeah, no, there were no warning signs whatsoever, so I had no idea that that could have been my last day on earth. Mm. And, I mean, we've we've touched on the idea of fate at several points in today's conversation, and I know it was only by chance that a nurse by the name of Grace Jones helped perform CPR on you before using a defibrillator, another word I can't pronounce, defibrillator, <laughs> which it, defibrillator. got it out, yep. good, 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 which yep. in turn saved your life. So, um, you know, you'd suffered a, a coronary occlusion, a blockage of one of the major blood vessels to the heart. You had such a, a close call. Now, I already know that you're quite a spiritual person, but going through this type of near-death experience must change you in such a, a deep and profound way. Talk to me about your sense of purpose since that event. Um, yeah, look, it's, uh, it's kind of a very surreal event because I don't remember it and you know, I woke up in hospital afterwards. Um, yeah, it's kind of like it didn't really happen to me. It's it's like that thing of again, it, it happened to Greg Wiggle. You know, it happened mm. to him, <laughs> not yeah. me. But no, I know I know it happened to me. I'm not that, that naive, and I'm not that dismissive of it. It was a big big event. It it nearly took my life, and it's impacted on my family. Um, you know, they they were very concerned at the time. Um, you know, it's impacted upon my Life decisions, I guess. You know, I have to clean up my diet. I need to get fatty things out of my diet so I don't get more blockages in my artery. I need to cut down my cholesterol. So it's had that kind of effect. But it's had a much more profound effect once I've found out how many people actually pass away through sudden cardiac arrest every year. When I found out that the survival rate from cardiac arrest is actually only 10%. Wow. I thought, yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm one in 10. There's, for every one of me, there's nine that don't make it. And that really shook me when I found that out. Then to find out, okay, so why did I survive? Well, I survived because there were people that did CPR. There were four amazing people on hand. There was, as you said, there was Grace Jones, who's a nurse. She jumped out of the audience. There was also a doctor, uh, Therese Wales. She's a GP. She, she, I think, was the first one to jump out of the audience there was also Kim Antonelli, who worked for the Wiggles, and there was Steve Pace, who was the drummer for the Wiggles that night. He, he'd just done a, a one-hour, 20-minute show drumming, which is quite a physical feat. Mm. But then he stepped up and helped perform CPR for 25 minutes or so until the ambulance got there and, and until the defibrillator got there to shock my heart back. So these four people really did a, a Herculean effort to keep me going until that point in time where I was able to be shocked back. So... Knowing now what this chain of survival is, and that is early recognition, CPR, and using a defibrillator, those three key points, the fact that somebody identified the fact that I basically passed out and was not breathing and called for help, the fact that there were people there doing CPR, and the fact there was an AED on site or a defibrillator on site, they're the reasons why I'm still here. The fact that nine out of 10 people who experience sudden cardiac arrest aren't here is 
in some cases because those three things don't happen. There's not early recognition of what's wrong with them. There's not CPR performed or there's poor quality CPR. And importantly, there's not a DFib on hand. So part of my mission now is to bring awareness around this to people about the fact that learn CPR because your skills can save somebody's life. Mm. Get a defibrillator in your workplace. Get a defibrillator at home even if you can because, you know, a lot of people will spend $1,500 on a new computer um, but that same amount of money or thereabouts can actually prepare you for the fact that you, a neighbour, a family member that's visiting, whoever it might be, could have a sudden cardiac arrest in your home. 75% of sudden cardiac arrests happen in the home. That's one reason why the survival rate is so low because people's homes are not prepared for that event. Like we will have smoke detectors and we might have fire extinguishers or fire blankets in the kitchen ready for if there's a fire, but we don't have these kinds of devices there when sudden cardiac arrest is actually our biggest killer in the country. We need to be more prepared and more aware of it. Mm. So, Greg, I have I have two questions. The first one's quite practical. Mm. Now, where do we go to do a first aid course or to learn how to do CPR? Yep, there's a number of places you can go to. I mean, the, the, there's two that I can recommend. There's um, St John Ambulance. They run CPR courses and first mm. aid courses. And there's also Surf Life Saving. They run first aid courses as well and they, they do CPR instruction. Um and I think it's important for people to understand too that you don't need a certificate to be able to do CPR. You can learn it online. You don't have to be accredited to know how to do CPR. You might need a certificate for your job, but even if you just understand how to do it, mm. you will be able to do it better than not um, having not any knowing idea. Yeah, and, and not having the confidence. That's right. You, the, the patient, is going to be much better off if you just step up and have a crack at doing it because if you stand back and go, oh, look, I don't know what to do, I'll wait for somebody who does, those minutes that are lost waiting for somebody could be vital in the the fact that that person is not getting oxygenated blood through the vital organs of their body. So CPR is very important. So even if you don't do a certificate course, get online and learn it, understand it, understand the principles behind it and just if you ever come across somebody who's in a situation that needs CPR, have a go. Mm. Because if you're not doing it correctly and somebody comes along who knows it, they will say, let me do it. But you might just be able to help keep that person alive in the interim. Yeah. So, I mean, February really wasn't that long ago. How were you uh, recovering, firstly physically, but but also mentally and emotionally from having such a big shock? Um, Look, mentally and emotionally, I'm fine, which kind of scares me a little bit, I think, (laughs) because like I said before, it it has been a very surreal event. And I think the fact that coming out of it, um, you know, coming out of it and realising these things that are so um, understated or undervalued in society about cardiac arrest, uh, unknown, that is really now what's driving me. That that has probably given me that purpose that takes away any emotional or mental effects about what happened because for me, mentally and emotionally, that's where my energy is in terms of raising awareness, being an advocate for AEDs and CPR. That's my mission. So, yeah, purpose does turn on events that happen in our life and it's about being able to recognise that and use it in a positive way. Mm. I think there's always, there's always a positive in things. It always is. You've just got to find it. There's always negatives. You can always find a negative for something, but it's the perspective of being able to find the positive in something that really can make a difference to how you, um, how you make the next step in life and how you go about joining those dots from that point onward. Absolutely. So, Greg, in, in closing today, you've obviously, you've spent your whole, your entire career working with kids. So what would be two or three tips you would give the, the, the kids of the world about discovering their life purpose? For the kids of the world, I would say have fun. Um, know no limits to who you are. Be safe as you do it. Be physically safe. Challenge yourself, challenge people around you, 
um, in terms of their perception of reality and, and what can be achieved. Be creative and be, be true to who you feel you are. Thank you so much for joining me on the Decoding Purpose podcast, Greg Page. It's been such an honour to have you here. Uh, where can we find you online? Do you have Instagram or LinkedIn? Where can, where can, we, where can we, you know, come and visit your digital home? <laughs> I don't really have one. I'm only on LinkedIn, really. Um, <laughs> I'm not, not really on Twitter or Facebook or anything. I've got to get that all happening because in order to live my purpose now, I realise that I've got to reach out to people who are on social media so they can get these messages about cardiac health and cardiac safety and preventing cardiac death. So I need to embrace those platforms. So look out for me on those platforms. But at the moment, you can find me on LinkedIn and you can also visit um, heartofthenation.com.au. That'll tell you a little bit about what I'm planning on doing in coming months about cardiac awareness and promoting a program that acknowledges businesses that have AEDs in place to um, help those people that experience cardiac arrest in their premises or nearby. Fantastic. Look, such an honour to, to have you here. Uh, such an honour to share your purpose with the world. It's such an important one and, and hopefully we can have you back again to, to tell us about, um, you know, tell us more about your journey as it goes forward. Thank you so much, Greg Page. Rebecca, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me. <laughs>